as the faculty lead for this program on enhancing security and justice coordination to counter transnational organized crime, let me welcome you to the fourth and final week of our proceedings. I am uh, also the moderator today for our final plenary session, which is about making coordination to counter transnational organized crime inclusive of citizens and communities. And on the virtual dais with me for this panel, we have Ms. Kemi Okanyoto, Executive Director of the Rule of Law Empowerment Initiative, also known as the NGO Partners West Africa, and Dr. Martha Mutisi. She is a Senior Program Officer at the International Development Research Center at the Regional Office for Sub-Saharan Africa in Nairobi. Before we begin, since this is our last week together, let me just extend thanks to each and every one of you for the energy and the thought that you've put into the contributions you've made during the plenary sessions and during the discussion groups for this program. At the Africa sessions, the debates, the analysis that you have done together here will be useful to you in the work that you're doing to try to dismantle criminal networks that are engaged in transnational organized crime. So I encourage you to build on the connections you've started making here with others in Western and Southern African countries who are involved in these efforts to counter transnational organized crime. If it's useful to you, we can always try to help you stay in touch with each other after the program concludes. And do feel free to use the chat function in tomorrow's discussion groups to exchange contact information with colleagues you would like to keep up with in the future. We certainly hope to facilitate that kind of exchange whenever there's interest. And we hope that the connections you've made will be useful as you continue your hard work. Uh, furthermore, I hope you will not hesitate to reach out to the Africa Center if ever um, it is useful to share more about the work you're doing on coordination. We hope to uh, walk alongside you in the efforts that you're making in these, in these areas whenever it makes sense. So um, in terms of uh, the business, the orders of business today, let me do a brief summary of some of the key takeaways from last week and then we'll move into our session. So last week we started thinking about subnational aspects of coordination to counter transnational organized crime. And we looked at urban and rural areas, comparing challenges in these different domains, including border communities. And in our discussion groups, participants from some of the island nations represented here also reflected on their geographic dynamics. Dr. Boglo brought up the need to ensure that people who live in geographic areas that make them vulnerable to crime are getting the kinds of development and governance that they need in order to feel like they're part of the state so that they're less dependent on transnational organized crime as a livelihood and so that they have more reasons to trust state actors who are trying to counter transnational organized crime themselves. This is the work that he does in the agency that he manages, the Beninese Agency for the Integrated Management of Borders. Um, so he looks on the local level um, at reforms um, that help the defense and security forces act and communicate in ways that are convincing people that the state's useful for ensuring the security of citizens. Um, these local level reforms frequently depend on things that we've discussed, like decentralization, community policing, grassroots initiatives to expand people's access to justice, whether civil or criminal uh, services related to that. State actors can't do that alone. They need civil society and local leaders who bring diverse gender, religious, political, and economic perspectives. And then Mr. Gordema emphasized the importance of state and non-state actors dealing with urban aspects of transnational organized crime. Urban centers must be considered in policy and strategy for coordination because of rapid population growth we see in urban African uh, contexts, particularly among youth. He spoke about the key role that intelligence actors, risk assessments, including crime network profiling, can play in facilitating strategies to counter transnational organized crime and related illicit financial flows. Coordination strategy should be based on joint assessments of the likely targets in urban and rural areas. They should identify what the red flag indicators of transnational organized crime are in those contexts. And then from there, determine the kinds of partners needed to coordinate to counter transnational organized crime. So Mr. Gordema as well talked about the role of civil society networks 
He also mentioned the role that the private sector and organized legitimate business could play in sharing information on transnational organized crime. So that's the brief summary from last week. This week, we are focusing even further subnationally. We are looking at citizen and community level aspects of transnational organized crime through coordination. So as both panelists mentioned last week, states do not often focus as much as they should on including citizens and communities in their broader efforts to understand, counter, and prevent transnational organized crime. So today with our two distinguished speakers, we hope to consider the perspectives on and experiences of transnational organized crime that citizens are having, whether they're men and boys or women and girls. We hope to analyze how community and citizen relationships with state security and justice actors can affect their trust in the state to implement coordinated efforts to counter transnational organized crime. And we will consider the grassroots elements of rule of law that may be uh, more frequently than not overlooked in our coordination discussions. So we'll look at a couple of different examples of community-based community and citizen-centric approaches to addressing these issues. We have two very seasoned and distinguished experts with us to speak about this today. It's an honor to introduce them, which I will do very briefly since you have the details of their biographies in the program document. Ms. Kemi Okinyoto is the Executive Director of the Rule of Law Empowerment and Empowerment Initiative, also known as Partners West Africa Nigeria, a non-governmental organization dedicated to enhancing citizens' participation and improving security governance and in West Africa more broadly. She was also the team lead of the policing component of the Security Justice Reform Program supported by the UK government. So she provides technical, strategic, and programmatic leadership for the Nigeria Policing Program, which and civil society for accountable policing services in Nigeria. She has over 15 years of experience in the justice and security sector and on governance issues in Nigeria and the region. Dr. Martha Mutisi is Senior Program Officer at International Development Research Center, IDRC, at the regional office in Nairobi. Her role is to support and undertake evidence-based research that helps citizens and public authorities address the sources of violent conflict, insecurity, fragility, and poor governance, while acknowledging the imperative for a gender transformative approach to solutions to these issues. organizations, including the University for Peace, the University of Zimbabwe Center for Defense Studies, the Open Society Initiative of Southern Africa, and, and many others. So welcome to both Ms. Okinyoto and Dr. Mutisi. We will start our moderated discussion now. So let's take Could each of you spend uh, just about seven minutes um, talking about this? So. My first question is, in your work, what have you found to be some of the ways that civilians, citizens, and their communities experience and think about transnational organized crime and state efforts to counter it? And here, if you want to compare um, you know, across men and boys and women and girls, please feel free to do that as well. Kemi, could I start with you? Yes, please. Um, first, I'll say that um, the way and manner in which transnational organized crime has impacted on security and um, the community, you see the face of it in insecurity, you see the face of it in violence across the region. And one of the enabling factor, one would say, maybe the artificiality or should we say the porosity of our borders also facilitates um, this. Um, over the couple of years working on this area, you see the face of it in different forms. So in human trafficking or trafficking in persons, for example, um, between Nigeria and Republic of Benin, you would see a, a trend where young girls are brought from 
Republic of Benin to different cities, mainly the big cities in Nigeria, to work as domestic um, servants. Um, you'd see the face of the young boys, I think, from some of the southeast states in Nigeria to Gabon, um, or between Benin and Togo, or even if they do come into Nigeria to work on farms, to work on um, um, at quarries, you know. So depending on what, depending on what you're looking at, um, because of the insecurity also, we're seeing a face of a layer. You could see a layer of trafficking in persons with drugs, you know. So the person that is being trafficked, this is a more sophisticated one, you know, could also be a mole that is, that is carrying um, drugs. And this you see more across the, um, maybe from the, bo uh, the borders, but air borders. So at the airports, you know, tra tra traveling to Europe. Um, you also would see the face of arm trafficking. So in recent times with the challenges in the Northeast, we've seen, and with banditry also in the country, we've seen scenarios where it's an organized um, network of somebody supplying the arms, somebody is moving the, um, the even food, you know, for the bandits or for the terrorists. So these are the different ways in which we've seen it, that you've seen society or communities where we work um, engaging, so to say, in, um, in transnational organized crime. For some of them, they really do not know what they're doing. For some, it's a sense of, it's a, it's, a, it's a means of livelihood. And for those that you say means of livelihood, we could look at those that live within the border communities where smuggling across is seen as trade and not really smuggling, you know, with the way the the way and manner in which we see this. Advanced fee fraud is also one, you know, that within the common parlance for us here in Nigeria, we call it 419. And advanced fee fraud is where we used to see mainly predominantly young boys. But now you are saying that young girls are also getting into it. And there have been series of busts by law enforcement and security actors, where you even have schools being set up, you know, to train, recruit and train these young boys and girls in um, the art of advanced fee, uh, advanced fee fraud, which we call 419 here. State efforts, the way we've seen the face of state efforts has been one legislative measures. So you see that um, you find the National Assembly or the parliament passing laws um, in responding to trying to address um, transnational organized crime. And some of the laws we see here that we've seen passed in Nigeria are the Anti-Terrorism Act, you see the Anti-Piracy Act, we see the Money Laundering and Terrorism Financing Prohibition Act, to mention a few. Then we have the law enforcement measures um, where you see coordinated um, or maybe joint task force uh, being set up across the agencies, um, customs, immigration, police, you know, um, having a co um, having um, coordinated joint task force. Then we have the military measures, which we are all familiar with, particularly when the um, issue being addressed carries a face of terrorism. So you see, have the military leading that. Then you have the socioeconomic measures, which I would say is the one that is the least, um, that there seems to be the least investment in, and that should be the priority because if you look at the driving force, the driving force is more socioeconomically related. So why not put more measures in the socioeconomic measures? Um, then finally, the bilateral cooperation. So we see bilateral cooperation around border management or joint operations. I know that um, in Nigeria, we have the joint border patrol um, um, across the border with our neighboring um, countries. So I know for a fact that the police have a joint border patrol, you know, they have um, with um, the sister agency across the border. So I'll, I think I'll just stop here and allow 
Martha say something. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimmy. Uh, yes, Martha, let's let's hear from you um, on on the same on the same question. How are citizens and communities experiencing um, transnational organized crime and states reactions to it attempts to counter? Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Kat. And uh, thank you, um, um, uh, Kimmy, for setting the scene. Uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll pick on from uh, where Kemi has left to say that uh, the communities are very often the theaters of crime. It is often the community members who are very much affected uh, by transnational organized crime, whether they know that it, uh, uh, it is transnational organized crime or not, but uh, its impact uh, affects them directly or indirectly. Sometimes they are also active uh, actors, uh, in these crimes or enablers, um, apart from uh, being victims of such crimes. So from, uh, from my work, I've, 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 I've noticed that it is important to move away from the idea that crime prevention are essentially matters uh, that are uh, uh, at the pres preserve of uh, the police, law enforcement, the security actors, and uh, the criminal justice system. Address, addressing transnational um, organized crime is a complex endeavor, which often requires broad-based responses, which often requires consultations with community members, and also understanding some of the community felt needs. So one of the ways that um, uh, communities have really uh, shown how they think about um, uh, organized crime is by actually taking part actively in providing the solutions towards uh, uh, organized crime. Uh, for example, if you look at the whole notion of community policing, it came out of the recognition that most often the state is absent uh, in the community and the, the, the community being affected by these uh, crimes, they have to do something. So the principle of community policing recognizes the community and its leaders as equal partners in the prevention, reduction, and addressing of crime. Uh, it is often a strategy that involves citizens in the design and implementation and evaluation of crime prevention programs. We've seen uh, in some communities uh, and I, I think in most countries across Africa, the rise and emergence of uh, neighborhood watch commun uh, committees, crime consultative com committees, which are actually multi-stakeholder committees that represent uh, law enforcement, government departments, business actors, uh, citizen, uh, civil society actors, as well as uh, security companies and even some financial institutions. In Zimbabwe, the concept of uh, CCCs, crime consultative communities, really arose as a result of the fact that uh, no one has a um, um, uh, monopoly uh, on intelligence, particularly com uh, community intelligence. So they meet most often twice a month uh, to um, uh, review the trends in crimes, and also to look at who are the main actors in such type of uh, crimes. That also puts the community at the center stage uh, of uh, uh, responding to these uh, crimes rather than uh, making them look like they are uh, bystanders or they are merely uh, uh, subjects of um, crime prevention strategies. Uh, we've seen in communities like Rwanda, where even young people are now actively becoming involved uh, in the concept of community policing. In Rwanda, the youth, uh, the Rwanda Youth Volunteer for Community Policing Program uh, emerged as a result of the recognition that young people are also affected by crime, not just as victims, but sometimes also as key actors in crime. So uh, the ROIVCP works in collaboration with the national police, security actors, uh, and other uh, law in enforcement uh, officials in the implementation of crime prevention strategies. They are not just there to implement the crime prevention strategies. They are actually consulted in the uh, process of uh, developing such crime prevention strategies. And then we also see um, that uh, in some ways we have community-centered security initiatives, which arose 
which, which have arisen as a result of communities wanting to do their part uh, in governing themselves. Uh, we have grassroots uh, or community-based initiatives uh, across Southern Africa, in East Africa, and I'm, I'm pretty much sure in West Africa. In East Africa, we have this concept called uh, the Nyumba Kumi. Uh, even though it arose not necessarily as a crime prevention measure, uh, what uh, authorities and government officials have uh, started to notice that was that it is actually a valuable mechanism for people to be aware of what is happening in the community. So Nyumbakumi simply defined, it means 10 households per cell. So each, each Nyumbakumi, each 10 household, they have a Nyumbakumi leader. So they go to the Nyumbakumi leader for everything, uh, whether it's uh, service delivery, governance issues, political issues, uh, economic issues, uh, food aid, but it's also a, 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 a structure now that allows community to assess what is going on in the community, particularly when we're talking about the prevention of violent extremism. So Nyumbakumi has now really metamorphosed from just being a local governance initiative that emerged uh, organically to become an initiative that can actually be used uh, for uh, crime prevention and for countering organized crime. Again, back to you, uh, to, to Rwanda, we have this concept of uh, Abunzi, Abunzi uh, uh, local persons of integrity who are nominated by communities uh, to mediate uh, um, um, between uh, community members on various disputes. Uh, so the Abunzi, when literally translated, it means a mediator. These Abunzi mediators, they know what is happening in the community, whether it's land conflict, whether it's uh, uh, issues to do with gender-based uh, violence. And actually, they are now also being recognized as a, ch as a channel and a strategy of really uh, uh, ensuring that communities are safe, uh, communities are responding to organized crime. And uh, last but not least, I would like to talk about the importance of the role of uh, traditional leaders. Traditional leaders customarily in Africa, they are assigned influence and uh, their jurisdiction uh, uh, is over communities, uh, whether it's at the village level or at the ward level. They advise the government on traditional affairs within their communities. But beyond that, beyond protecting cultural values, beyond inculcating a sense of belongings, belonging in their areas of uh, juris jurisdiction, traditional leaders play a very pivotal role in the prevention and reduction of crime. They have jurisdiction over various crimes like assaults, domestic violence, sexual and gender-based violence, uh, land conflict, livestock, theft, among others. So they preside over such issues. And in most cases, they collaborate with uh, the police, they collaborate with security actors in investigations, and they are key uh, in providing evidence. So they are often also uh, significant stakeholders in mobilizing the participation of their communities uh, in crime prevention strategies in mobilizing community members, for example, to participate in, co in, in community policing initiatives. Uh, we are increasingly seeing the recognition of traditional leaders in various forums, not just at the national level. If you look at many African countries, uh, they either have traditional uh, leaders uh, act or traditional governance act, which is a recognition that they are a pivotal um, uh, um, uh, st structure in not just governance, but also in, in, in crime prevention. Uh, at the level of SADAC, we have the SADAC Council of Traditional Leaders. At the level of the African Union, we have the African Union Council of Traditional Leaders. They have been involved in efforts to uh, campaign against child marriage, for example, to campaign against human trafficking. So uh, beyond uh, uh, promoting cultural values, beyond uh, uh, promoting togetherness and social cohesion, traditional leaders are an institution that can be tapped into uh, when it comes to uh, addressing uh, transnational organized crime. Thank you so much, Martha, um, for, for everything that you shared there. Um, thanks to both of you. So let's move on to a second question. This time, Martha, I'll turn to you first. Um, how can state security and justice officials best build trust with citizens and communities 
in places where coordination is needed to counter transnational organized crime. So in other words, I'm wondering if each of you could offer some examples of inclusive approaches to addressing transnational organized crime that could help facilitate that trust that needs to be built with the state and citizens. Martha, over to you first, please. Thank you, Kat. Uh, yes, I think uh, I'll, I'll start from the premise that a decline in trust and confidence uh, in the police, in the law enforcement uh, system, in the security actors, in the judiciary, or in the entire criminal justice system is inevitably harmful to the ability of the police uh, and the pub public to work well together. So one vital issue that needs to really uh, be underlined is the importance of building public confidence, building trust. Some of the strategies that can be implemented to build trust in include one, engaging in a very collaborative approach to crime prevention. Uh, this uh, includes facilitating tar targeted partnerships uh, with uh, uh, not just uh, law enforcement, but also other government departments, civil society organizations, and community members, so that people feel that they are part of the process uh, of designing a crime prevention agenda. Uh, two, I think uh, it's also important to address issues of uh, uh, perceived and actual corruption. Uh, in most countries, uh, whether it's studies that have been done by the Afrobarometer survey, there have been indication that people feel that they do not trust the police or law enforcement officials. So one of the issues is uh, really to try and decrease the social and psychological distance between the members of the public and the uh, law enforcement officials. And to do this, we need to address corruption uh, in the police system, corruption in the judiciary, corruption in uh, the general law enforcement system. For example, when it comes to human trafficking and smuggling, um, issues of uh, corrupt law enforcement and judicial uh, officials often facilitate things like illegal adoptions, cross-border transfers, uh, the issuing of fraudulent papers. Again, even when you're talking about uh, the current COVID pandemic, there have been issues of mistrust that citizens have uh, continuously raised about uh, fake uh, COVID certificates that allow people to uh, travel from one country to another without necessarily taking a COVID test, which means that the fight against COVID becomes uh, a very difficult enterprise because of the corrupt system, uh, corruption in the uh, law enforcement, but also corruption in the immigration, corruption in our medical departments, corruption which is a cancer to society. So I think uh, one uh, area that really needs to be looked at is to address the issue of corruption within the security sector, within law enforcement, and also within other departments, other government departments that collaborate uh, in, in crime prevention. Uh, combat, combating corruption uh, would be uh, uh, one way of supporting a, a, uh, the issue of restoration of trust between law enforcement and citizens. The other uh, point that I would like to raise is the issue of human rights violations, uh, particularly committed by law enforcement officials or security actors. Uh, in most cases, allegations of police misconduct, allegations of abuse of authority, or use of force that is not uh, uh, requisite to the uh, type of uh, crime that is co committed has often led police uh, and, the, uh, and the army to be viewed uh, in a less favorable light by citizens. Whether it's in Southern Africa, we're talking about the relationship between the state and uh, citizens uh, in, in Zimbabwe. The whole notion of uh, uh, allegations and actu actual in instances of human rights violations has uh, actually contributed to um, um, that lack of trust. So for, for me, I think I would underline the issue of addressing human rights violations ensuring that our law enforcement systems uh, respect human rights during investigations, uh, during uh, evidence gathering, during prosecution, uh, and also respecting uh, the notion that one is um, innocent until proven guilty. So uh, that would be one um, um, piece of advice that I would give. And also, I think in the previous sessions, we've talked about the issue of delay in justice as uh, one of the area 
that uh, leads people not to trust law enforcement um, um, uh, and uh, security actors. So uh, the police, uh, prosecutors, the judiciary system, they need to be seen to be delivering justice expeditiously. The reporting levels would increase. Most of the times people do not report crimes because they do not think that anything, something is going to be done. Even if they report, maybe the, the, the case will be postponed and postponed until they even give up and they, they don't feel like they, they want to attend the court sessions. So justice delayed is actually justice denied. Um, another um, uh, recommendation that I would give is to uh, ensure that our, our police, our law enforcement officials, our judiciary, they also adopt a crime prevention approach rather than a reactive approach. Reactive uh, approaches have been known to be less effective uh, compared to proactive approach. So when we're talking about proactive approaches, we are talking about and under using data, using research, using analysis, using community consultations to understand where does the crime ha happen? When does the crime normally happen? How does this crime okay? Who is involved? What kind of behaviors is associated with such crime? What are the impacts of such crime? And what are the driving factors towards this crime? I think understanding some of the structural drivers of crime would actually help us to be proactive, to be preventive in our approach. And I think this builds on to the issue of the importance of a peace building and violence prevention approach. Uh, uh, law enforcement officials would also benefit from the contribution of civil society organizations that engage in peace building and violence prevention. If you talk about South Africa, there, is a, there are several organizations, including the Center for the Study of Violence and Re Reconciliation. They actually have done studies um, that uh, can actually help the police in their crime prevention approaches. For example, the, uh, the, a study which was undertaken by the C CSVR revealed that the community works program, uh, which is um, such a sort of social welfare program uh, implemented in many urban areas in South Africa, particularly poor urban areas like Alexandra and Johannesburg. It's actually a stepping stone for young people who's, who think that their future is bleak, youth who are at risk, or people who are formerly incarcerated who have no opportunities. It's actually a stepping stone for them to address their socioeconomic needs. So a peace building approach would be very important in actually rebuilding uh, some of the trust that mistrust that we see uh, between law enforcement uh, and uh, citizens. And uh, maybe let me just conclude by two more, two more suggestions. I think there's also need to ensure democratic control over the security, over the law enforcement officials, judiciary actors. So here, the, the role of oversight bodies is very important. The role of parliament, the role of uh, civil society actors like um, Crime Watch uh, is very important so that at least the police, uh, law enforcement officials, the judiciary know that they are accountable to other people, not just to their bosses, for example. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I would call for the importance of uh, developing and implementing broad-based and inclusive national crime prevention strategies uh, where non-state actors actually effectively participate. Women, youth, civil society organizations, religious leaders, traditional leaders, because all of these uh, uh, entities, they possess community intelligence, they possess uh, ideas and insights about what is it that makes their communities vulnerable to crime and what is it that can be done to counter such crimes. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much, Martha, for making um, quite a few salient points. I'm sure a lot of these will come back up for discussion in the Q&A and in our discussion groups. Kemi, can I turn to you asking the same question? How can state security and justice officials best build trust with citizens and communities in places where we need to coordinate to counter crime? Um, just as Martha has said, it's um, this is an approach. This is something that is that should be multifaceted um, and multi-stakeholder involvement. 
um, and multi-stakeholder involvement, multifaceted would also mean being deliberate in bringing in the marginalized communities and the communities that are impacted directly by transnational organized crime. That said, um, if I take it from the point of um, delaying justice that um, also raised by Martha, I'll give an example of some of the work we've done here. So when we started at P1, one of the things we um, quickly um, um, identified was that there is a lack of trust in the judicial system. And um, when you interrogate that a bit further, it's because of the perception of corruption. And I use the word perception because what people do not understand people would criticize and maybe make certain comments or statements about it. So what we decided to do was to recruit young people that are not lawyers, that are your average citizens and trained them. And we developed a framework which has become a flagship framework on observing court processes. So from the point in which the cases are filed, they are assigned and um, it comes up for hearing in courts. All that process was is what we assessed. And um, we also found that there were no timelines between the time cases are assigned by the, they are filed in court, mm -hmm. they get onto the table of the chief judge for him to assign to the courts and for it to get back to the registry for it for the case files to move to the court. So those lags give opportunity for anybody that is mischievous to take advantage of this. Um, all, secondly, is um, in Nigeria, we have this, um, the police have a force order 20 that was amended, which, which we call the, um, it allows for the Legal Aid Council in collaboration with the Nigerian Bar Association to have lawyers in police stations. So you have what we call the police duty solicitor scheme. So you have lawyers placed at police station level. So anytime anybody comes into the police station, you have the accessible services of the lawyers. But it was nice, force order amended in book in the in the force order in the in the laws or should i say the regulations of the police but it wasn't being practiced so we are piloting that also in the fct and we have um, recruited um young lawyers and we have engage, we're engaging with the police also and they have assigned police stations to us and so we have this young lawyers placed at the police station level what are we trying to do we're trying to breach that gap between the citizens and the police. Because when you hear from the side of the police, whatever it is that they're saying seems to make sense, right? And when you hear from the side of the citizen, whatever it is they are also saying seems to make sense. So where's the gap? You know, it's a lack of understanding of what each party needs. So that's one way we're trying to help to build the trust. So you identify where the gaps are and try and bring them closer together. Under the um, court observation, I know that based on some of based on some of our reports in the FCT, for example, there are now timelines. There are now timelines for assignments. There, uh, there was a practice direction the former CJ came up with that brought that addressed the issue of the lag and put in certain timelines and also um, have them, um, um, I think, public notices for lawyers and for um, persons using the courts that if you do not get good services, if this is not done by social time, this is a complaint mechanism that you can um, refer to. Um, another um, recommendation of that I'll say is um, looking at other means of addressing some of the um, crimes, the, some of the transnational organized crime, right? Rather from the lens of the criminal justice system. So one is drugs. So when we're looking at drug trafficking, a lot of times we look at it from the lens of the criminal justice system. And you'd ask, why not look at it from the lens of the public health? Um, system. 
and see if that might be a less threatening um, entry point that also allows the criminal justice actors to walk through the public health actors build trust, build relationship, and be able to get the necessary information that would assist them, you know, not go after the foot soldiers, but go after the main actors that are basically financing this. What we see most times is that it's the little um, small fishes that are being crushed, whereas the main um, echelon remains in intact. Same thing with the trafficking in person um, issue. Why not go through the lens of the public health? Because we know as a fact that most of them will be used as commercial sex workers. Okay, yes. So rather than go through the um, hammer of the criminal justice system, look through the public health and um, safety system, then I'll look at the traditional justice system. Martha mentioned this. So it's looking at the traditional justice system because they do exist and they do have influence. And like she said, they do control some form of um, um, area of the judicial, traditional judicial system on the ground within the community. Um, some years back, um, working with the British um, Council, um, what we did under the Justice for All program was to design training and capacity building um, initiatives for the traditional justice actors. So they help them better to record because a lot of times they're not very good with record keeping. So you help them with record keeping. You help them also with abridged versions of the laws of the land, you know, so that they are not just moving based on intuition and based on what they feel is right, or this is how we've been doing it, but guide us through the rule of law and the mechanics of the rule of law within the state where they are operating. And of course, finally put in place a referral pathway. So they also help, they are, they are assisted to identify certain criminalities that are not misdemeanors, that are not community, that cannot be settled at the community level, you know, that needs to be escalated because they are symptoms of a more serious issue. So that referral pathway also put in place and the checks and balance that um, comes with it. Finally, I will talk at the level of um, the states and um, similar to what we, um, what we said about the uh, similar approach of the public health um, um, angle rather than criminality is to look at how the um, international community can maybe support preventive diplomacy. And I'll speak for the West African subregion and of course the continent as a whole, whereby issues of illicit trafficking, transnational organized crime, terrorism, you know, is looked at through the lens of peace and security, peace building, nation building, and assists the um, the states, the the West African states to develop the apparatus that would ad help them address these issues. Because like we said, most of the root causes are, are governance. Most of the root causes are hinged on socioeconomic issues. So helping to address the socioeconomic issues while still keeping an eye on the um, criminality of it. Thank you. Thank you to both of you uh, for, yes, for these excellent articulations of how this is the governance and socioeconomic issue as core and how then taking um, some more community centered peace building focus citizen security focused approaches might might help deal with some of the root causes some of the structural issues behind why these criminal networks thrive um, and survive so final question for me to pose to both of you uh, this time i will start with kemi could you each share some best practices from your civil society work on development and governance that might be useful for the security and justice actors in our audience who are hoping to do things that can help build trust with citizens as they're trying to work on transnational organized crime. Um, I think I started by giving some examples. So I'll say for us at P1, one of the 
our approaches, I'll give maybe examples of two or three of the way we work. One we say is facilitated discussions. So facilitated discussions allow us to bring multiple stakeholders that are interested um, in an issue together. And what we do is be the unbiased objective facilitator. We do not come into the arena. We just help to distill the issues and help both all parties um, articulate their point of view, help them um, see where there are convergence, help them identify where there are differences of opinions and why there are differences of opinions. So they can further explore if they, there could be convergence, even though there are differences of opinions, maybe it's a difference of approach, you know. Um, so we say we do this through our facilitated um, discussions uh, or dialogue expertise. Secondly, is our approach on collaborative advocacy. We say collaborative advocacy because all of us working within the policy arena are advocating for one thing or the other, you know. Um, because of, uh, maybe because of our mission statement, because of the sector we belong to, we might think we're working against each other, whereas we are all trying to achieve the same goal. So we map our allies, we map those that we feel that we have the same objective, even if our approaches are different and see how we can work together. So an example of our collaborative advocacy approach is what we have with the judiciary ongoing. When we started in 2016 with the court observation, we were not sure we would get access into the courts because the courts were basically very closed. But with the discussions and with engagement and bringing in multiple stakeholders, they had input into the design of the framework of the assessment um, toolkit. And when we review, we bring them in also to review. We also have another layer of a third party assessment. That's what we tell them. It's a third party assessment. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not here to take uh, the place of what you have as organizations or as institutions. But when we present to you our finding, it's for you to use it to assess or compare with what you have. If we're both saying the same thing, then you know we're onto something here and we should dig a bit um, further. Um, also, we, we, have, we carry out um, surveys so periodic surveys, uh, periodic surveys, and I'll use the judiciary as an example also. So our periodic surveys could be with the court users. And that is anybody that uses the court, either you are a complainant or you are a lawyer, anybody. And or we could have with, we could break it down, prosecutors, separately what their experiences have been, defense counsel, even from the judges themselves, what their experiences have been, the non-legal um, staff of the courts, what are their experiences? And we triangulate this, you know, so that you, at the end of the day, you could find the judge saying, I'm unable to go on because the lawyers are never prepared. They're coming for one adjournment or the other. Um, the uh, complainant or the suspect Oh, I was ready to go to, I was ready for, to be in court, but at the last minute we couldn't move to court because there was no vehicle to transport us from the correctional services to court, you know. So you see the multiple level of challenges and then we are able to identify who is responsible for doing what and why has the person not been able to do this a lot of times it comes down to budget a lot of at times it comes down to budget at times it comes down to weak supervision because nobody's checking if the person assigned that duty has carried out his or her duty that day nobody there's um, um, checks, you know, it also comes down to infrastructure, you know, so at times it could be lack of infrastructure for something as basic as electricity. So there has been power cuts and there are no generators. There's no way the judge will be able to sit, 
no matter how important the cases are. So what we do based on our findings, we come up with policy briefs, we come up with fact sheets, we organize one-on-one -on -one bilateral meetings with different um, actors within the, that might be responsible, because we also find that when you meet with them, individually you might be in you might get a more positive result when we do this over a period of time and we do not get a positive result then we go public and say this is what we've done these are the steps that have been taken and this is how this um the lack of um the lack of commitment or the lack of response is impacting on uh, maybe the criminal justice system or on everybody or if it's a good step that has been taken we also commend you know, the steps that have been taken by whoever it is that has um, taken the good steps. So I would say um, collaborative advocacy, empirical, empirical um, uh, research or evidence of whatever it is that you're talking about, because when you come with anecdotal, it's easy to be washed away or um, undervalued. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimmy, for sharing um, that example um, um, or that set of examples um, of, of how you're doing this at P1 and um, why it's important to do it that way uh, on the basis of evidence, on the basis of building those bilateral relationships um, and also the advocacy element of what you do. Martha, could I turn to you asking the same question? What are some best practices from your work in civil society? that might be useful for security and justice actors in our audience who are hoping to build trust with citizens? What can we learn from your work? Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll start from uh, the uh, point that Kemi raised about the importance of doing surveys. So for me, I think it's important to integrate research and analysis to support crime prevention work. Um, this uh, leads us to the idea of evidence-based policing, evidence-based um, uh, uh, law enforcement and uh, judiciary system. Um, and we are beginning to see that there is now respect for evidence-based analysis uh, in, um, um, uh, by law enforcement officials, uh, by police, uh, by judges, uh, who are actually collaborating with civil society organizations um, in various countries. If I talk about uh, Southern Africa, for example, you would find that uh, organizations such as the Institute for Security Studies, the Center for the Study of Violence uh, and Reconciliation, um, uh, the Catholic Commission for Justice and Peace are some of the organizations that are actually engaging uh, in research, uh, in analysis to support crime prevention work. For example, ISS has a crime and justice program which releases information on crime trends, but also on citizen perspectives uh, and perceptions towards the police, towards law enforcement officials, which allows the police and law enforcement officials to review such information, uh, like the patterns of crime, uh, the excess in crime, the dynamism of the crime, and to institute the necessary corrective measures or proactive measures. Uh, in Kenya, for example, we are also seeing that uh, there are think tanks that are, that, that are actually being created. They are quasi-governmental. Uh, in Kenya, we have the National Crime Research Center. It is a quasi-governmental crime research center, which was established under the Office of the Attorney General uh, in the Department of Justice. But the interesting thing about the National Crime Research Center in Kenya is that it is not just made up of law enforcement officials who want to understand crime. It's made up of psychologists, it's made up of anthropologists, it's made up of economists, public health officials. As Kemi said, it is important to move away from a securitized approach to crime, to try and understand crime from a holistic perspective. What are the issues, for example, the family issues that drive people towards crime? If you want to understand um, the violent extremism, for example, in, in Kenya, for example, you need to go to the family unit. You need to look at the dynamics between parents and their children. You also need to uh, look at issues of dating. Some people are even uh, recruited uh, or lured into violent extremism because of the, the need to feel to belong uh, or the, the need to, you know, to have uh, some um, uh, relationship that is uh, 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 reciprocated and things like that. So such institutions are actually shedding more light 
uh, on the expansive nature of crime and the multifaceted uh, drivers of crime beyond the, uh, the usual uh, causes that we um, um, might uh, 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 assume that, um, that these are the drivers of crime. And also uh, related to that, I think the training of law enforcement officials should also not just be done by uh, law enforcement people. So if you are to, to look at, uh, for example, the Zimbabwe National Defense University, the Zimbabwe Staff College, now they are actually being very open and receptive to inviting professors, resource persons from civil society organizations, from uh, universities, from academic centers, from think tanks, because they know that it, crime is too, too, too grand of uh, uh, an issue to be uh, really tackled by one entity. They need a multiple perspective. So capacity building support towards uh, crime prevention is also very important. I think we've seen a lot of organizations, um, uh, for example, uh, ISS, I go back to ISS in South Africa, which has produced a guide on evidence-based policing, which is supposed to be used by police officers, researchers, and community members. I think these are initiatives that we are beginning to see a move away from uh, law enforcement as the only answer to uh, crime prevention. And then we also have uh, um, initiatives, uh, uh, good practices such as uh, support towards security sector transformation. How do we professionalize our security access? How do we mainstream gender? in our security access? How do we integrate human rights, respect for human rights uh, in the training, in the professionalization of our law enforcement officials? Um, again, in exam examples from Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe Security Sector Project, ZSSP has been involved in this security sector transformation initiative. And actually it's gaining traction in the sense that other actors, other civil society organizations are now coming in, providing support. The Center for Conflict Management, for example, supporting the peace building angle, uh, the Women's Resource Center and Network, looking at the gender nuances of crime prevention so that gender is not left out. Uh, another important um, uh, and also um, uh, strategy that I would consider a best practice is the prison outreach initiatives. Uh, more often than not, we, we, there is this assumption that once um, prosecutions are done, sentencing is, is done, and someone is sent to prison, that is the end of it. And yet there is a cycle, a cycled approach to crime. Most people relapse even uh, when re released from prison. So it is important to ensure that we have civil society organizations that engage in uh, prison outreach programs, whether uh, it is through provision of uh, livelihood uh, initiatives, training them for life after prison, uh, uh, providing psychosocial support, providing spiritual support, uh, and just preparing them for life after prison so that we prevent this idea of uh, reoffending or recidivism. Non-state actors can play an important role in prison outreach. We've seen churches doing a lot of this. We've seen uh, non-governmental organizations doing a lot of this. In Zimbabwe, we have the Zimbabwe Association for Crime Prevention and Rehabilitation of the Offender, uh, ZACRO. It is a civil society organization which is made up of uh, people from multi-sectors, people from public health, people from uh, um, uh, the, the sector of livelihoods. Uh, some focus on HIV prevention among prisoners. Some focus on uh, life skill building and things like that. I think that would be a very important approach to avoid a, a, a continuous cycles uh, of uh, commission of crime. And then I would also say that um, one of the good practices is uh, a law enforcement system and a criminal uh, justice system that is transparent and open to the public. Here we're talking about law enforcement, security sector actors and judiciary actors, building relations with the media, using the media, uh, use, using media outlets, even Facebook, uh, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter 
to publicize positive interaction between law enforcement and the communities they serve. Um, we, we are now increasingly seeing even pol uh, you know, police services actually participating in agricultural shows. Uh, I know in, in my country of origin, Zimbabwe, uh, there's the Zimbabwe Agricultural Show uh, at the national level and also at the various provincial levels. The police participate, the judiciary participate. It is a way of actually ingratiating themselves towards uh, the communities and also raising awareness uh, and also participating in outreach. And uh, in, uh, we're also increasingly seeing the movement uh, from uh, uh, the changing of names. It might look like a, a, a small thing, the changing of names from a police force to a police service. I think that in itself communicates a lot. It says that the police are there to serve the population. They are not a force to use uh, physical force or to be feared by the public, but they are an entity that the public can actually collaborate with. And then uh, another best practice that uh, I'll raise is that it's also important, as Kemi has already raised, to use a multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral approach. So we shouldn't forget the role of our uh, independent commissions. Uh, in Kenya, we have the National Commission for Cohesion and Integration. In Zimbabwe, we have the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission, the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission, the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission, Zimbabwe Media Commission, the Gender Commission, all these independent commissions. They are, the citizens feel that they are more accessible. They even have complaint hand, handling mechanisms and citizens can access them without fear, without fear of uh, backlash. And the information that they would get from uh, these uh, interactions would be helpful from a crime mm. prevention approach. Uh, and then I would also uh, put them in the uh, same bracket with offices of the ombudsman, the public protector, uh, public protectors, and things like that. So I think law enforcement officials, security actors should be able to create institutionalized platforms of collaborating with these commissions and uh, these independent actors. And then also uh, another best practice that I've seen is also to really address the root causes of crime, uh, the, dri the, 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 the drivers of crime, particularly the economic causes of crime. If you look at urban Africa, much of urban Africa, um, the, it, it, it is characterized by a lot of uh, challenges uh, over urbanization, a strain in service delivery, unemployment, particularly youth unemployment. Um, and then we begin to see a lot of vulnerability being created by these challenges. Youth become vulnerable, they become recruited uh, to, uh, into drug trafficking, into violence, uh, into other forms of crime uh, that, that are even serious like homicides and things like that. So, a good practice that I've seen from South Africa is the implementation of uh, what is called the Community Works Program. Uh, it started in the uh, late 90s. It used to be called the Extended Public Works Program, where the government, through the Department of um, Public Works, would uh, issue um, grants and free basic services to community members. In return, the communities would be expected to clean the streets, uh, to repair broken pipe, water pipes and sewer pipes and things like that. Not only were the communities participating in making their environment livable, but they were also gaining an income and getting, getting a hand up, not a handout, but a hand up. Now that the uh, public works program has been expanded to several cities in South Africa, it's now called the Community Work Program. It's now coordinated by the Department of Traditional Affairs and Cooperative Government. Um, of course, in collaboration with the Department of Public Works, the uh, Department of Home Affairs, the Department of Correctional Services, and they are intentionally seeking out youth at risk, they are intentionally seeking out those who were formerly incarcerated. I think that's an initiative that not only deals with the economic drivers of conflict, but also it deals with other drivers like the lack of belonging, uh, the, uh, uh, the sense that communities are not being consulted on what matters uh, most to them in their localities. 
Uh, and then I think another um, uh, best practice that I've, I've also seen is the, the security sector dialogue and outreach program, uh, programs that are conducted in various countries. Uh, these are some sort of crime awareness campaigns uh, through theater, through, um, you know, through creating specific departments that have interface with communities. In South Africa, they have a program called Say Stop, Say Stop Crime Program, which is implemented uh, in collaboration between the Department of Social Development and the Department of Home Affairs. Uh, working with civil society partners, of course, like CSVR, uh, like um, uh, Accord, among others. The idea is to build trust, uh, to forge collective ownership of the crime prevention agenda. And then here in Kenya, we are also increasingly seeing police liaising with um, a sector that is often ignored. Uh, I don't know, uh, in Southern Africa, it might not be common, but maybe in West Africa, it's, uh, it, it, it's a common means of transport. It's called the border border riders. Uh, the, they use motorcycles to ride uh, in urban areas. It's a faster way of getting to where you want to go. But more often than not, the border border associations and the border border riders have also been known to be easier recruits for all sorts of crimes, including violent extremism. So creating that interface, uh, whether it's monthly meetings and quarterly meetings, is very important because they have knowledge of the communities. They drop people in on and off uh, in different spaces. So having that, um, uh, uh, institutionalized interaction with them is very important and also capacity building them. Now here in Kenya, we have what is called the Safe Border app. Uh, it's an app that you find on the phone. Uh, it's trying to reduce border border crime related, uh, crime related to border borders because now you can call your border border rider on the phone and you can get their, 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 their name, the number plate, at the time that they come to pick you up. So it's easy to track crime. So I think also digitalizing uh, outreach programs is one way that we can actually say it's a good practice in terms of countering uh, organized crime. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you so much, Kemi.